Welcome to The Curiosity of A Child Episode 25 Yep Unfortunately here in Guernsey we're back in lockdown aren't we after many many months of being nearly sort of queen of free really and able to yeah. walk around we're in lockdown so it's back to homeschooling Which isn't too too bad Yeah we kind of get on with it don't we? Mm-hmm. But I hope all our listeners are keeping safe Shall we get on with the show? Yep, on with the show Today, we're going to talk about a man who helped change the course of a nation. He lifted it from poverty, transforming it from one of the poorest countries in Central America to one of the richest. He did this sailing some of the most dangerous waters, including those of Cape Horn, which had claimed over 800 ships. That's a lot. This was to transport coffee halfway around the world. The country is Costa Rica, and the man is... William Lalasha. <laughs> That's no drama, is not I know. And the man is... William Lalasha. Yes. William Lalasha is probably better remembered in Costa Rica than here in his native Guernsey. So I don't really remember ever doing anything about him at school, um, or having him mentioned, but at school you've been doing him, haven't you, Anton? Um... We were meant to be. It's probably just that uh, we just started the topic um, before we went into lockdown. That's true, yeah. But, yeah. Now, William, he was born on the 15th of October, 1802, and his first name was really Guillaume, <laughs> which is French or Norman French for William. Hmm. I don't know if he anglicised his name, um, as at the time he had a tendency of fighting the French. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's pretty why he went by the name of William. Yeah does sound better than GM. 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 <laughs> um, and he had a brother and a sister, but he was the middle child. Mm. There was a history of C in his family, and one of his grandfathers was actually a privateer. Mm. And it's also called William Lilasha. <laughs> uh, but his parents were farmers. And there's little else known about his early life. But he would have worked the land with his father and probably received some kind of sort of basic form of education. And I'm pretty sure he was um, born in the parish... Yeah, parish of forest. In That's Guernsey. right. Yes. However, the call of the sea was strong, and he followed in his grandfather's footsteps and decided that he wanted to go to sea. That sounds a little bit like Moana. <laughs> Moana. Okay, it's nothing like that. Okay, and the singing is much better than Moana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he must have worked and studied hard because in 1827 he was a captain on an 111-ton brig called the St George. That's heavy. Nice name, though. And even though he had spent years of his life at sea, he still found time to have seven children with his wife called Rachel, mm-hmm. who he married in 1830. But sadly, two of those, both called William, died when they were young. Oh, poor William. Williams. <laughs> Williams, <laughs> yes. <laughs> when he was the captain of the St George, he was probably only about 24 or 25 years old. I have, like, um, a theory about that William one. Cause it has to be the granddad for the next child to be called William, not the... Dad, because you know... That skips a generation. Yeah. Yeah, such bad luck. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so he was 24 or 25 when he was captain. So I was thinking, that seems quite young to be a captain. Yeah. So I tried to do some research on the average age, and I couldn't find exact dates or places, but in the 1700s, the average age of a Royal Navy sea captain was about 32. Mm. In the second half of the 19th century, sailors aboard Scandinavian merchant vessels had an average age of 25 when they first went to sea so to be a captain at his age that's rare (laughs) yeah so it seems like he was probably pretty good at sea Mm -hmm. so maybe just a natural and it seemed that this would serve him well in the future and in 1830 he became captain of another ship a 55 ton cotter called the Mivera no the Minerva (laughs) And this was most likely carrying fresh fruit from the Mediterranean, Spain, Madeira and the Azores back to England. And it's really important that they ship that quickly, so obviously you don't want it to rot whilst it's aboard. No, and you definitely don't want bananas with it, because all the other stuff will start rotting. That's right, yeah. There must be, like, specific banana boats. I wonder what they would be called. <laughs> but then bananas do kind of look like a boat. Yeah, maybe they just sell the bananas themselves. Yeah. Or you could make a banana raft and then just push it in the direction that you want. Having gained experience, and I dare say a reputation as a fine captain, William founded Lalasha and Co. in 1836 with another captain, 
Captain Grace. <laughs> With an another captain called Captain Grace. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, Grace, he had experience of carrying sugar and goods from the West Indies and South America, so he, he had been sailing across the Atlantic already. Hmm, that's good. Well, what do you need if you want to own a shipping company? Ships with three exclamation marks. <laughs> yes, ships. You know I'm going to read the answer. Oh. I'm going to pluck that from your brain. Oops. <laughs> now, do you know what the difference between a ship and a boat is? Um, ships are bigger and boats are smaller than ships. Okay. I think. Yeah, well, there seems to be lots Ooh, of different... different spelling. <laughs> different spelling, yeah. There seems, to be, ugh, there seems to be lots of different definitions, and I'm not sure there's a strict exact one, but I found a couple here. Um, among sailing vessels, the distinction between ships and boats is that a ship is a square-rigged craft with at least three masts, and a boat isn't. With regard to motorised craft, a ship is a large vessel intended for ocean-going, or at least deep water transport, and a boat is anything else. But I prefer this one. One answer to that is a ship's captain gets annoyed if you refer to his vessel as a boat, but a boat's captain does not get annoyed if you refer to his vessel as a ship. <laughs> so what's a submarine? Um, it's like... Is it a boat or a ship? It's neither. Oh, it's a boat, because it's anything other than a ship. Yes, yeah, a boat. Yeah. Anyway, as fortune would have it, another Guernsey man, James Sabir, had recently opened a shipyard in 1839 and he produced very fine vessels and you've got a little bit about them here haven't you? Yep. James would build eight vessels in total for William between 1841 and 1861. The first ship he constructed was the Lady Mansell which survived until 1885 when it was wrecked. So shipwrecked. The last ship that was built, the Costa Rica Packet, set the London to San Francisco speed record of 131 days. Yeah. A San Francisco newspaper reported, she is the best built ship to ever enter this port. So That's pretty, pretty impressive. pretty high praise. <laughs> yeah. And they recommended that merchants and shipbuilders go and see the vessel, a noble specimen of marine architecture. Yes, that's pretty amazing. So, a really fine shipbuilder from this tiny island. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, the ship, the Costa Rica Packet, it's actually got a very fascinating history after it was sold. Um, the captain who bought it, he caused a bit of an international incident, which we might do a special <laughs> episode on. Yeah. The first of his own ships that William would captain was called the Monarch, which is a bark, which he would sail to Brazil. Now, I've got two conflicting sources here about the exact order of events of what happened. Uh, so it might have been over one or two voyages, but the basic story and facts seem correct. At the time, there was a global recession going on, so that means that the economy and businesses were struggling. Um, so when William set off, he decided to actually sail around the south tip of America, Cape Horn, which mm -hmm. is like really dangerous and difficult seas. And as you said earlier, 800 shipwrecks. Exactly, yeah. So you can see that how rough the seas are. So he would have sailed from, say, going to London, the UK. I think he went via Liverpool, actually, on those trips. So it's obviously a major port. Mm -hmm. And they sailed uh, down sort of the coast of Europe and to the Azores. And they cut straight across the Atlantic to Brazil. Then they'd sail down the coast and then round Cape Horn, but apparently he cut it quite wide, so you don't want to go too close to the rocks there. Yeah. Then up the west coast of Chile, yeah, South um, America. Chile, Peru, and then past Ecuador. That's right, and, yeah, and then to Central America. Mm -hmm. um, so a really long voyage. So could you imagine sailing that in a wooden boat? I mean, you'd have to trust it's well made. Yeah. The first voyage lasted from February 1841 to September 1842, when he returned to London. So you're at sea for so long, aren't you? Yeah. But um, I saw there was another boat, which was also built in 1841, so that must have been a little bit later. Or maybe he went out on that 1841 boat to return to another boat and be like, oh, I like this boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yes, it's a long time to be at sea. It's really important to understand this. So. Um, the length of time that it actually took to ship goods back then really added to their value. Yeah. Uh, so it's so hard to get hold of. I mean, not anybody could go and do this. And then sailing around the southern tip of America um, added several months to the journey time. 
Yeah, but could he have just like cut through or just gone straight there? Or did he have to go all the way? No, well, he's kind of looking for opportunities there. And he'd heard um, when he was in Mexico of the Costa Rican coffee trade, but that was all on the Pacific coast, not the Atlantic coast. And there was no easy way, even though it's quite a narrow country, there was no easy way for them to transport the goods to the Atlantic coast at the time. Um, we'll cover a little bit of that later, actually. So he had to go all the way around to get it. And um, yeah, traveling by sea was easier until you had good roads or aircraft or um, railways, really. Yeah. That's why if you look at the Roman Empire, it surrounds the Mediterranean. It was easier for the Romans, say, to go from Italy to Carthage in North Africa than it would be from, say, Rome to Paris in France. Mm -hmm. Even though today they'd think different. Right, where were we? So during his voyage, he stopped at the port of Mazatlan on the Pacific coast of Mexico, as I said. And there he learned about the Costa Rican coffee growers and they were struggling to find buyers with whom to export their product. So he decided to investigate. And then again, the sources have vary on if this was a first or a second voyage mm. uh, to America. Not, not everything was so clear and, um, when we were researching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually managed to get hold of um, an old kind of book about this from the library where they had to go into the secret archives to get this for me. Yeah. And actually, I've also got hold of another story, which we don't have time to cover today, about somebody's actual time aboard one of these ships. That's cool. Um, so maybe we'll cover that in the future. So it's a good story, that. Well, Sounds actually, it's a sad story. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we'll cover that next time as maybe a little kind of short feature. Um, yeah, so there's no direct shipping of coffee from Costa Rica to London. Everything had gone through European merchants up until now, but not particularly successfully. And London was one of the centres of the coffee trade. And then Costa Rica, the Pacific side of the country, they produced some of the best coffee there was in the world at yeah. the time. So the enterprising William decided that this was a niche he could exploit. Yeah, so after his first voyage, where he had probably made some contacts with the coffee growers, mm -hmm. um, he had returned home to London. And then about a month later, he left again on the 30th of October, heading back to South America. And by March 1843, he had reached the Pacific side of Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And after another year of kind of being at sea and sailing and uh, trading, he had returned to London for the first direct shipment of coffee from Costa Rica. So he had begun his trade proper. Yay. <laughs> During his time in Costa Rica, he made lots of important connections with local coffee growers in San Jose, which is the capital. Yeah. And he would have ridden probably on horseback. Costa Rica cowboy from Port Punta Arenas to yeah. the capital inland. Now, interestingly, the son of one of the families um, who he chatted to, they actually studied in England under George Stevenson. And do you know what he's famous for? No. He was the inventor of the rocket. Do you know what the oh, rocket was? Oh, yes. Um, it was a steam train. Yeah, it's like the first train. Yeah. And railways, they have a big effect on shipping in the future. As kind of you hinted at before, actually, mm -hmm. when we were talking. And he could also speak English, which was really helpful. So it allowed William to speak with the locals as he didn't know any Spanish himself. So negotiations were made um, with support from the British Council. And William was prepared to actually risk his own money on the venture as well. So that gave the locals more confidence to deal with him. Yeah. But then when he was kind of returning with his first shipment of coffee, he was actually delayed by bad weather. Oh. And it took him two months longer than he thought it would. And that caused a bit of concern with the local Costa yeah. Ricans because they thought, have they been wrong to trust him? Because I don't think he'd actually paid all of them. He actually had to go off and sell the coffee and then he'd be bringing and payment back. And obviously they wouldn't know mm -hmm. like that he was delayed. Yeah, and you can't just transfer it over the internet. <laughs> no. This type of trade was difficult. I mean, these delays could have a big effect. Mm -hmm. The Monarch, a ship that he was captaining, carried over half a million kilograms of coffee. That's a lot of coffee. Yeah, so I think it must have been sitting really low in the water. You would have been able to smell it as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would get rid of like the sea smell. If people don't like that. Oh, nice, nice. If people don't oh, like it. Oh, if people don't like it, yeah, sorry. But as I said, he did return, and the locals, they were right to trust him. And there's an article by Luis Fernandez, who wrote for one of the Costa Rican newspapers in 1933 telling the story of one family here. I think it might be his own family, actually. Same surname. Mm -hmm. 
There were many who believed that the Fernandez family were taking too great a risk, but the risk was worthwhile. Pessimists declared that it was a crazy adventure. Only the word of an English sea captain, and many doubted that Captain Lalasha would keep to his word and return. When there was a delay, many and bitter were the commentaries, but Captain Lalasha returned with many money and goods. The price received by Fernandez was a revelation. The future richness of the country was established. In 1849, Gordiano Fernandez died, but his wife succeeded him and continued in spite of having a large family to bring up and educate. To deal with Captain Lalasha ensured the family a prosperity, and when she died in 1890, the family fortunes were firmly established. Madame Rosario del Fernandez is a noble example of a Costa Rican wife. Yeah, and I noticed in there it mentioned about um, how, like, about the richness of Costa Rica becoming, like, one of the poorest to one of the richest Mm -hmm. countries. And it's actually Costa Rica in Spanish. I think it means rich coast. Yeah. And Louis, he even wrote to the Lalasha family in London saying, We Costa Ricans, we always have a fond memory of your grandfather. I myself remember the family tradition. That's in 1933, so it's quite a long time after the shipping, isn't it? Yeah. But he still remembered. So so the impact he had is amazing. There was, like, at school, there was a visitor who came in, and um, it was an evacuee from Guernsey. And Mm -hmm. then they went to England, and they met someone the same age as them. And they kept in touch for, like, the next 70 years or something. That's amazing. These friendships that were made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you've just said, actually, Costa Rica... It was one of the poorest countries in Central America. Mm-hmm. And it had only gained its independence from Spain some 20 years earlier. So this new trade had the potential to revolutionise their economy. Yeah. And they didn't actually have any regular fruit or coffee trade route with Europe since becoming independent. So they were sort of struggling to survive, really. Yeah. But um, the Costa Rican independence, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. When Mexico declared independence from Spain in 1821, Costa Rica became part of the Mexican Empire. Mm -hmm. But that didn't last very long, and in 1823 it helped create the United Provinces of Central America. (laughs) But instability with the other member states caused them to leave in 1838. Oh, lots of things (laughs) happened. Yeah, so turbulent times for the people. Yeah. But William, he wasn't just taking coffee from Costa Rica to London. The Costa Rican government, they'd actually used the profits that they made from selling the coffee to buy machinery and equipment and goods and That's good. all sorts of things and then import those back into the country, which improved the coffee production and also the overall kind of so you just well-being. Keep, you keep looping that to, um, until you get like more and more money so you can make more coffee so they'll buy more. Exactly, yeah. It just keeps going like that. Yep, yep. So they really improve the quality of life for people and it's actually good to see uh, such wise investing from a government, which we don't always get. Yeah. But it wasn't only coffee and machinery and things that he carried, was it? No. He carried school kids. <laughs> that sounds really wrong. <laughs> sounds funny. Um, so tell anyway. me more. <laughs> he took the boys of prominent Costa Rican families to England um, so that they could study and get like a proper education. Okay. There were 16 in total. And he made sure that they were well looked after. Here's a quote. Over to you. <clears throat> he took young Costa Ricans to England and installed them in professional schools, fretting over them like a parent and taking them back to Costa Rica, prepared to fill important roles as professionals. <laughs> Overreaction. <laughs> anyway, thank you. No problem. The education they received helped to make Costa Rica stronger as they were able to use their skills and knowledge to help improve their country. When in England, they also fell in love with a game. Really? What game's that? Football. Oh yeah, that's a good game. When the boys returned to Costa Rica, they took football with them and it soon spread. And in 1990, they qualified for the World Cup for the first time, so that's like the Costa Rican national team mm-hmm. um, their chances of winning hmm. good a thousand to one <laughs> <laughs> so not much chance then nope anyway they didn't win the world cup but they did beat Scotland <laughs> sorry Liam <laughs> <laughs> and Sweden mm. yeah I like Sweden anyway here's the first ever world cup goal and it's with Spanish commentary as it's much better. 
power of that kill and nice finish. That was really good. like an air raid siren. <laughs> they do go on forever. Yeah, and oh, look how dejected the Scottish keeper looks. What a shame. <laughs> yeah, so massive moment for them in their footballing history here. Let's yeah. watch again. Yeah, oh, lovely back hill. It was box. a great back hill. And chipped over the goal as he <laughs> That's dies. That's really funny. Oh, that one just looks Beautiful. nasty. <laughs> what a finish. Right. Anyway. William Lalasha is sort of indirectly responsible for bringing beating Scotland <laughs> beating Scotland yeah for introducing football to Costa Rica yeah I wonder actually with the other South American countries how it spread there I wonder how if they were already playing it or not mm, yeah but back to our story so um, for some people football is a religion isn't it <laughs> yeah but for William it was a bit different and um, upon first arriving he described Costa Rica as Poverty stricken and superstitious. Now, years of Spanish rule had meant that much of the population had adopted uh, sort of Catholic worship. Mm -hmm. However, William, he decided in 1844 to take Protestant Bibles on his next voyage. Yeah. Um, and a letter of recommendation was sent to the British Foreign Bible Society recommending William on this course of action. Mm -hmm. And it says, Captain Lalasha is a member of my church. He is about to return to Costa Rica. I know of no man in this kingdom of Great Britain to whom he may have more confidence to entrust Spanish Bibles. Uh, pretty high praise. Yeah. Then the first Bibles, they arrived in January 1845, and a small community soon built up around them. And William spent 4,000 pesos buying a house in San Jose, mm -hmm. which was probably used by the Protestant worshippers as kind of their first sort of place to have their Church congregation. house. Yeah, yeah. And he actually sold the Bible at cost price, making no money for himself. That's good. But with Costa Rica being a Catholic country, the religion it was actually protected by the government itself. So William needed to get permission from them to hold his Protestant uh, congregations. Mm -hmm. But such as his weight with the Costa Rican government, after kind of all he had done, uh, more than that of any other foreigner, permission was given. It's also thought that this may have led to the considerable religious liberty that was allowed by Costa Rica's 1848 constitution, which is good. Yeah. Because uh, that's an important thing to have, is you don't want persecution for people's beliefs. I mean, whatever you believe, you should accept that other people have their own beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and William, he even sent a Bible to President Jose Maria Castar. Caster. I guess where that's I where think I San typed Jose. his name wrong. <laughs> I guess that's where San Jose is from. Like, I think San Jose was already named. I knew that. <laughs> yeah, so he sent a letter in 1849 and he, he received a letter of great appreciation in reply. But there wasn't actually a Protestant church built in Costa Rica until after William's death. And his son, John. John Lalasha. John took over the trade and in 1864, he carried a prefabricated church made of iron on board of his ships to Costa Rica. <laughs> An iron church. Yeah, and then, so imagine how heavy that is. Yeah. And it was, yeah, taken to Costa Rica, and then it was assembled and put together there. So it would have had some wood boards and things in there probably, yeah. but the main frame was iron. Um, this is the Church of the Good Shepherd, but it was nicknamed, for obvious reasons, the Iron Church. <laughs> and that lasted pretty well, but in 18, no, not 18, but in 1937, it was replaced with a new, kind of more traditionally built church. That's better. And it includes a plaque that commemorates William. Yeah, here's a photo of the church. Yeah, it looks a little bit like a castle. It's not, it doesn't have buttons. a steeple <laughs> or anything. And that's the iron church there. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's made out of iron, really, but it is a not perfect, perfect photo. Yeah, it's hard to tell from that. Mm -hmm. um, but in our story, William's not dead yet. No, well, so. <laughs> w the William we're talking about, not his sons. <laughs> <laughs> Why? That's, that's cool, man. Yeah, so with his growing success, William commissioned James to be able to build more ships, allowing him to transport not only more goods, but transport them faster. I mean, now he made fast ships. Mm -hmm. With this, he helped further raise the quality of life of many Costa Ricans and raise the wealth of the, co of the country as a whole. 
and his ships they're featured on postage stamps and even banknotes it shows how important it is to the country yeah I remember you showing me a picture of one of the banknotes. Bank I haven't actually put them in here, but yeah, you've seen them already, yeah. though, haven't you? Um, but it's time for a quick advert. 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 Time for a quick advert. Advert. We have very generously been sent a book from Blue Ormer Publishing, and they are a local publisher with lots of really cool uh, books about history in Guernsey and the Bailiwick. Mm-hmm. And uh, what book do we have here? It's called Occupied, and it's a book about the occupation of Guernsey during World War II when the Germans came over for five years. And it's got it from the beginning, when all the evacuees were sent away, um, until we were liberated in 1945. Yeah, and it covers lots of cool things like commando raids, evacuation, um, people using secret radios, the building of the fortifications and all sorts. Mm -hmm. And it's written by a local tour guide and illustrated by them too, called... Victoria Robinson. Yeah, it's really cool illustrations, isn't mm-hmm. it? It's aimed at um, kids your age. Mm-hmm. So highly recommended. And if you want to get hold of this book or any of the other Blue Ormer books, then go to blueormer.co.uk. That's B-L-U-E-O-R-M-E-R.co.uk. We're certainly going to enjoy reading ours. Cues the sad music. Every day, children like Anton podcast for you. But in return, they receive no reviews. Just five minutes of your time could help a child such as Anton raise his self-esteem and have his voice heard by more people throughout the world. Please, please, just spare a moment to review him on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, Google Podcasts, Podbean, or anywhere else where you get your reviews. You have the power to change a child's life. Like mine. Right, back to the show. (laughs) (laughs) That was good. Yeah, so he's done a lot for the country so far, hasn't he, it seems? Yep. Brilliant, yep. Make up. (laughs) If you want reviews, damn it! <laughs> um, but you possibly make the... me sad. Again. I'm so sorry. What would make you happy? A review. <laughs> right. <clears throat> anyway. Um, yeah, but possibly. Oh, I've come up with. Sorry. No, yeah. I've okay. come up with a ring. Have you? I'll be happy if I get a review from any of you. You mean a jingle? Jingle, jingle, ring, ring. <laughs> jingle, jingle, ring, ring, ring. Right, can I get on with the show, please? <clears throat> yep, on with the show. Um, but possibly the biggest thing he did for Costa Rica came in 1856. Now, do you know what a filibuster is? No. Now, um, I just want to draw on this man's face. <laughs> he's got a picture. And what? He's... Oh! What have I drawn on his head? You've made him look a bit like a devil. Yeah, a devil. <laughs> Not because filibusters are devils, but... <laughs> Okay. The specific ones. <laughs> well, a filibuster. Um, it's somebody who engages in unlawful conflict with a foreign power. So it's basically somebody who starts a war without the permission of their government. What? Okay. Uh, and one such chap was William Walker, an American physician, lawyer, I better not say much about lawyers, <laughs> journalist and mercenary. And here's a picture of the horrible man. <laughs> man of graffitis. <laughs> I think we need to put this in the show notes. Here's a picture of the graffitied man. Yeah, and he organised several private military expeditions into Mexico and Central America. And he wanted to establish English-speaking colonies mm-hmm. that would be under his control. So it's a Spanish-speaking area. And in July 1856, he proclaimed himself President of Nicaragua. Yeah, basically taking over the country. <laughs> Earlier in March of that same year, he'd attempted to invade Costa Rica as well, to the, just to the south of Nicaragua, with a force of German, French and American troops. So this is just a small expeditionary force. Mm-hmm. And upon hearing this, William Lalasha, he made all of his ships available to the Costa Rican army so they could sail up the coast, because the route over land would have been far too slow to get there in time. And I imagine that they would like know the seas quite well. Oh yeah, he'd, he'd definitely know the seas well, yeah. 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 And for this, he actually received a formal thank you from the Costa Rican government. And nearly 100 years later, the editor of a San Jose newspaper um, wrote an article about it, and I'll read some of it here for you, okay? Mm-hmm. Thousands of troops in their baggage, etc., 
could never have made the overland journey to the northern frontier by land with any hope of defeating the invaders. So it was then that a man who had only been to the country two or three times before to load his schooners at our Pacific port, but who had truly become devoted to our country, a man whose memory we must do justice to esteem his real value, Captain Lalasha, a man who got our country out of its difficulties. Thankfully, he got them up the coast in time, and on March the 20th, um, the Costa Rican army prevailed in the Battle of Santa Rosa. So there'd be more fighting against Walker, with them sending additional forces against the Costa Rican army, but they managed to uh, prevail. And there was a key strategic victory on the 11th of April in the Second Battle of Rivas. And in that battle, one soldier he actually sacrificed himself, making a daring attack to set fire to the filibuster stronghold. Did he do it? Mm -hmm. Yay! Yeah, it seems he did. But Walker, he poisons the local water supplies with corpses. Bad. Yeah, and apparently nearly 10,000 civilians were killed in the fighting mm. um, and by his various actions. That's about 10% of Costa Rica's population at the time. Gee. So that's like Major massive. Numbers. Yeah, I mean, that's awful. Mean. But Costa Rica prevailed and they'd also be crucial in uniting the various Central American countries and their armies in the fight against the filibusters. Which is good. Mm -hmm. Walker, he was executed by firing squad on the 12th of September 1860. And I can't say yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I don't think he's a particularly yeah. nice man. So another but he was a doctor and a lawyer. Guernsey, another Guernsey great has beaten another American person or America. Yeah, that's what I've just got here, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, so without William um, Lalash's ships to help transport the army, that wouldn't have been possible. So like Sir Isaac Brock, the hero of Upper Canada... He'll be covered in a previous double special episode. Another Guernsey man from a tiny island helps stop an American invading one of its neighbours. Mm. <laughs> Sorry to our American listeners, we honestly love you really. <laughs> because we can hardly talk, being uh, British, I mean, we've hardly got a particularly good colonial past. But saying that, America and the CIA in particular have kind of had a bit of a habit of sticking their nose into the Central and South American countries, haven't they? Mm, yeah. And uh, probably a lot more than they should have done. But for mm. some reason, Costa Rica, it's been left alone more than most. Perhaps they're fearing a repeat of the past. Mm. But sadly, on the 27th of June, 1863, age 60, William Lalasha died. Dun, dun, dun. He never lived in Costa Rica, but it seems he fell in love with the country. Yes, it brought him riches, but he still went above and beyond merely being another merchant. His actions helped to shape a nation. Go Guernsey. Go Guernsey. <laughs> so it seemed he combined real business acumen with a genuine honesty. He had a fleet of ships that were described as very superior and excellent by the surveyors, and that were captained and crewed by a fantastic team, and they were transporting a quality product. He shares his success with that of a nation. Now here's a obituary in the Star, which is a local Guernsey newspaper. Mm -hmm. Now the Guernsey Press and Star. Mm. It said the following. Guernsey never gave birth to a man whom the island had more cause to be proud of, or deserved to be more lamented than him whose decease we record. By industry and intelligence and his Christian virtues, he entitled himself to the highest esteem which society can confer. And I've got a couple of quotes here from some Costa Rican historians as well. And they say that he was largely responsible for raising Costa Rica from the lowest position culturally, socially and economically, all of the Latin American states, to the highest. Mm. And, and another one says, and it's a long quote, so I've just got a small part of it here. After a long voyage, he returned to Punta Arenas with a ship loaded with goods from England and with enough money to pay Senor Fernandez and the other coffee growers. Captain Alasha, with his astonishing gift of being an adventurous businessman, opened up for Costa Rica a brilliant future with a new market for our coffee in England. The arrival of the monarch in Punta Arenas on 24th of December 1843 was the best gift that the Costa Ricans received from Providence. Costa Rica was enabled by the trade with England in exchange for coffee to introduce woolen and silken materials, cotton drill, I'm not sure what that is. I think it's like a type of wood. I think it's going to be a fabric, it's really listing fabrics here. Yeah. Cashmere woolens, linen, damask and muslins, etc. Economic prosperity um, enabled literature to spread, bookshops opened up everywhere, education flourished, overseas professors coming to teach the Costa Ricans. So that's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of him there. 
<laughs> He's got a top hat in his hand and a cane by the looks of it. But what of the coffee trade and the Lasher and K's shipments? Well, if you remember earlier, I mentioned the son of one of the big coffee growers studied under George Stevenson, the inventor of the first steam train. And then you also mentioned why you did have to go land to the Pacific side, didn't you? Yeah. Then modernisation was coming. And in 1910, a transcontinental railway opened that stretched from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast. And this reduced the need for ships to sail right round South America as the goods could now be transported across the country, which has saved months of time. That's, that's very good. Yeah, it's a big difference there. Then in 1914, the Panama Canal opened, which then gave ships a route right through the middle of the Americas. Today, Costa Rica is the 15th largest coffee producer in the world. Hmm. And I'm told by those who visited, absolutely wonderful country. Yeah, it, um, there are lots of photos and there's so many different animals there. Hmm. But um, something like, I don't know, I think it was 25% of their land is donated to wildlife and stuff and like wildlife centers mm -hmm. things like that yeah that's brilliant yeah that's the right way to do things mm -hmm. right attitude of a country mm -hmm. when you have so many animals it seems from right at the beginning their independence they seem to have the, had the right ideas mm -hmm. and on 15th of september of this year they'll celebrate their bicentenary 200 years of costa rica wow yeah that's good if you happen to be listening in Costa Rica, please, please, please get in touch and let us know if you've heard of William Lasher and what he means to you. Yep. So thank you very much for listening and we'll do our usual little rundown here. So we're on Instagram now, at yep. Curie Child Pod. We're on Facebook, at Curie Child Pod. <laughs> we're on Twitter, at... Curie Child Pod. That's right. You can even email us at hello at thecuriosityofachild.com. We really want to hear from you. And also you can look at our website, thecuriousofachild.com. That's right, yeah. So there are millions of ways to keep in touch with mm -hmm. us now, so there's no excuse. Oh, also, no. also, mm -hmm. also, yeah. you have to leave reviews so that I don't get sad. Oh, yeah, that's right, yes. That was a really heartfelt appeal there. Yeah. Yeah. So please, please, please review us. And we will be back with another episode soonish about something, won't we? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Take care, everyone, and we will chat to you again soon. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Bye. Oh, yeah, I love you.